that the ANC narrative within their branches and with their um, electorate is that everything that's currently happening with ESCOM, the, um, the total collapse is orchestrated by white owned businesses. And the reason why they're doing this is so that it can be privatized. So that's the conspiracy theory that's being told by ANC leaders. Is, is that actually prevalent, um, like mainstream within the ANC? Within the ANC, that's so very That's prevalent. shocking. It's very shocking, and there's no proof there. Wouter Wessels is a member of the National Assembly of South Africa, representing the Free State, Free Start, the Cheetahs. Wouter, welcome to the show. Thank you, Donald. Thank you for having me. Wouter, um, did you study anything? I, I couldn't find anything online that you studied anything. Did you go, poof, smack bang, from high school into politics? I studied a lot of things. Um, <laughs> I actually started with uh, medicine. Um, at the University of the Free State. Um, I didn't complete that. I uh, started a business then. I was in marketing and uh, corporate clothing and those type of things, branding. And uh, I studied a lot of other subjects, uh, a few law subjects, media, marketing, those type of things. Uh, but then I became full-time involved in, in politics, worked in Bloemfontein um, at a district municipality as the party's liaison officer moved then to uh, the office of the then leader of the party, Peter Mulder, when he was the Deputy Minister of Agriculture. Uh, worked there until I was elected to um, member of the provincial legislature in the Free State. And I was then elected to Parliament in 2017, where I've been up until now. Uh, you, you replaced Peter Mulder's seat. Um, there wasn't an election in 2017. You replaced Peter Mulder. Yeah, that's correct. I was internally elected, yeah. That's correct, yeah. Interesting, interesting. Um, okay, Voter, I can't imagine you're very proud of the free state at the moment, right? The general conditions in the free state. What, what is your opinion of what's going on there? Well, it's a legacy of many, many years of bad governance, of uh, really mismanagement. And it, it started on provincial level. And without going into, I'm not a political analyst, but if you go and you read about the ANC, especially in the Free State, it's always been a very divided organization in the Free State. There's always been two ANCs, um, the North and the South. There's always been the dispute about who should become Premier. Now, a lot of people don't know, but Ace Mahashile has been the president or the chairperson of the ANC, or was that from 1994 up until he became Secretary General of the ANC in 2017. But he only became Premier um, in 2009, which means for very long, um, the national ANC, the President, President Tarbon Becky, and even before him, President Nelson Mandela did not recognize or did not think that Ace Mahashile would be a good Premier. It's only under Zuma that uh, Makhshile then did become Premier, that was to consolidate the Free State. That was the project from the ANC side to try and uh, get those numbers going. And uh, Ace Makhshile was the man. But behind the scenes, even if you had a, um, Beatric, a Beatrice uh, Marshall, uh, Winky De Reco, and all those other Premiers, Ace was always the man behind um, those in power. He always actually made the decisions and a lot of the mismanagement is as a result of him. And that's why he's, he's currently facing a lot of court cases and why he's being criminally um, charged. Municipalities are mismanaged um, and uh, that's where the whole service delivery um, dilemma started is uh, people were appointed, are appointed based on political affiliation and not only on political affiliation towards the ANC. But once again, that's why I took the, the term towards those factions within the ANC in the Free State. So now it's faction against faction, it's political violence, it's, uh, it's, it's really the Free State is a, is, a, is a boiling pot of what is what was happening and is happening within the ANC and it started in the Free State before it started in other places 
And uh, that is why there's s such instability. If you look at Mangurum Metro, um, it's, it's the worst run metro in the country. It's under um, national intervention. There's recovery plans. There's all type of things that just just, just for our viewers, Mang it's, it's just for our viewers, uh, Mangoong is um, obviously Bloemfontein. Um, That's great. Yes, yeah. Sorry, sorry. Go, go on. No. So um, yes, Bloemfontein and uh, Bloemfontein that was once um, quite a functioning city, and uh, Mangoong that was a functioning municipality just uh, is is now in in shambles. Uh, water problems, electricity problems, that's, that's uh, additional to the normal load shedding. Uh, people in Bloemfontein are used to having, to not having water for two, three weeks um, on end. Roads are completely um, destroyed. And a lot of the money that came from national government, from national taxpayers' money, um, has not been spent. It, it was spent on contractors that never came to the party and actually did anything. So uh, the corruption, the looting is just uh, out of control and rampant um, in the free state. Yeah, it's shocking. Um, we have family members in Pretoria and we every time we drive through the free state on our way there. And yeah, I mean, bottles, general oh. service delivery. I mean, people buying hooners in the middle of the street. I mean, it's... it's it's like going back in time. It's it's yeah. It's really shocking to see this. Absolutely, and uh, once again, people are suffering. You know, if you go to to um, to Bronville in Machabing, that's the Valcom, Virginia, Inaman um, municipality, and uh, for for many many years, we've we've laid so many uh, human rights commission um, uh, complaints already with um, sewage running in between houses. Children that that uh, is having to walk to school um, through sewage, people getting sick, and those type of things are problems that's been there for so many years, and the municipal um, government does not do anything about it. They just leave it, and and that's the sad thing. People are really suffering, um, uh, you know, uh, throughout all communities in the free state. People are suffering. And um, a voter have you heard, I, I think it was in the report or the burger, there are four towns in the free state that are energy self-sufficient. Um, do you know that story? What, what is happening there? I think it's private um, companies that are basically ensuring that four towns are self-sufficient. Yes, uh, it was in report yesterday, um, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, it's, it's not yet self-sufficient, uh, but uh, it's, it's getting there. It is a private um, company. Um, I don't have all the facts, but uh, there's, it, it does prove the point that if privatization and above privatization, we say that the whole uh, electricity network and system needs to be fragmented into smaller portions. You can't solve the crisis of addressing the whole elephant. You will have to divide it in smaller portions. And I don't mean, as the government put it, um, and Provin Gordon has said it many, many times, and it's still not happened, but he said we must divide between electricity generation, uh, distribution, and sales. The three different entities split them up. That's not good enough. We need to, to completely uh, fragmentize the whole network into certain areas or smaller areas and get private investment going. As these four towns are an example of where they are getting at, uh, this can be the solution because then you have private businesses and private companies and privatization that can take place in that area of that fragment. To try and privatize the whole ESCOM now won't solve the problem and uh, you'll just be left with, with the uh, exact same challenges as ESCOM is, is facing currently. What do you think of the suggestion to um, put ESCOM under um, Guedem and Tashi's portfolio, moving it to energy? I think that's the plan. It won't, it won't solve anything. Uh, the, the fact of the matter is that, uh, well, we, we do um, also... Um, we, we also agree with the notion that the Department of Public Enterprises is an unnecessary department. 
um, it was actually established prior to 1994 to privatize to get all the state-owned entities privatized. That was the, the reason for the department's, um, uh, well, why it was established. But uh, that's not what happened, obviously, after 1994, it became a department on its own, um, with its own budget, a lot of money being spent, and uh, uh, state-owned entities just uh, completely collapsing under that department. But if we take an example of South African Airways, at a stage, I can't exactly remember when, I think it was in 2016 or 17, um, SAA was moved from public enterprises to the uh, National Treasury to see if that won't solve the problem, exactly as now the thinking is with ESCO, because SAA was then also completely uh, collapsed. And we know, we all know what happened with, with uh, SAA then later on, but that didn't help anything. Uh, Treasury was then under, uh, I think it was Minister uh, Nene and it was uh, Minister Gordon, um, and nothing actually changed um, with them being the political heads of, of SAA. So that's not where the solution lies. Um, once again, we need to uh, decentralize and there's a lot of small steps that needs to be taken. A lot of it is not um, politically, uh, or, or the political will, um, is absent from the governing party side to do that because it's not popular to move away from the ideology of the state um, that needs to own everything is very unpopular within the ANC. And we also know what's currently happening is that the ANC narrative within their branches and with their um, electorate is that everything that's currently happening with ESCO, the, um, the total collapse is orchestrated by white owned businesses. And the reason why they're doing this is so that it can be privatized. So that's the conspiracy theory that's being told by ANC leaders. Is, is that actually prevalent, um, like mainstream within the ANC? Within the ANC, that's very that's perfect. shocking. It's very shocking, and there's no proof thereof. Um, there's no no s substance in in any of those uh, theories. But that is where our dilemma lies. To to carry on doing the same thing over and over again won't um, bear any different results. We need a change in our whole thinking with regards to the electricity provider. But there's, there's, so there's long-term ideological things that will need to happen. But there's also short-term things like, why is it that um, some of our neighboring countries that's also clients of ESCO, like NAMPAL, doesn't, are not subjected to load shedding? It can't be that I am a client, you are a client, and the viewers out there are clients of ESCO be it through a intermediary like city power or whatever but they uh, clients of esco they are subjected to load shedding and load reduction but another client that should be on the same level like namibia power is not subjected to load shedding uh, whilst there's a crisis and that's unacceptable so we're sacrificing south south africa's economy um, to uphold an international agreement that they, sh they, they should be a mechanism to say we can't now supply the, the full contract worth of electricity because we have a crisis and I think that's that's common um, international law that can be practiced there and contract law and ESCOM does not have the will to do that at this stage and South Africa's government does not have the will to do this because we don't want to upset our, our neighboring countries. And there's a lot of other things, you know, one of the very shocking things that a lot of people don't know is that there are currently functioning uh, power stations that are being decommissioned. Um, uh, Kumati has already been completely decommissioned. In Drina, um, power station has 10 units. Of that 10 units, currently only six are functioning. Four has been decommissioned, turned off already. The plan is to, to turn another one off by March 2023 and then by 2025 
having the complete plant decommissioned. Why? Because of the Paris Climate Change Agreement to move away from coal. Now, it's all very nice to say we, we should limit our, our carbon emissions and so forth. But whilst we have an energy crisis, the economy is suffering, food security is at risk, um, people are losing their jobs and their livelihoods, people are literally dying because of load reduction in a, in a lot of cases, because of hospitals and so forth. Now, whilst you're in that crisis, you can't say, let's do this very nice thing that, that, that's expected of us through the ratified uh, Paris Agreement. There's no sanctions that will be brought against us if we were to say, let's for now, stop with the decommissioning of coal plants. Let's just get energy going. Let's have these functioning um, power plants on full capacity whilst we try to get alternatives and get a new plants going, get upgrading, get Madupi functioning and Gosili functioning and all those type of things. Let's just get Andrina, which is there, to produce the power that it can. And that's the type of short-term things that we are demanding government to do at this stage. Who do you think is driving this in South Africa? Do you think it's, what's her name, Barbara Creasy um, from the Ministry of whatever, she's the, the Minister of Climate Change or something like that. Um, do you think she's driving this? Yeah, she's, she's environmental affairs. I, th I think her department plays a role. You must remember that uh, President Ramaphosa was also there last year, also shaking the world leaders' hands and saying, we are going to do this. There is money that, that, that comes with this, um, you know, uh, sticking to the agreement. But that money is, in our view, a drop in the, in the, in the ocean of this crisis. It's not going to solve the problem. And we, we, we believe that there is some negotiating power to say um, we are going to switch over, but we are actually delaying the, the adherence to this agreement by currently having an energy crisis. Just switching off that uh, those uh, power plants does not make us, um, uh, um, uh, what do they call it, just, just um, it's, a, it's a just, um, clean energy project and being just means also being just towards the um, the people of South Africa having electricity to 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 provide in the needs of South Africans and then also having the economy going so that we can switch over to renewable energy in a 10 20 year project but it's not going to happen overnight the 8 billion or whatever we get from from certain um, uh, you know, first world countries in terms of this agreement is not going to allow us to solve the energy problem and to switch over to renewable energy. So money is, is talking and this international agreements and the president saying we are going to do this, that's where the problem actually lies. Walter, what do you think of Afri Forum's plan to um, build a... Um... Uh, 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 energy, uh, uh, okay, perhaps you should just speak because I'm, I'm just going to bugger it up. But what is their plan specifically with a new energy <laughs> company? Well, it's, it's, it's in line with what I said, that we need to um, fragmentize the, the energy network and get more self-sufficient um, private entities to provide electricity. We also need competition within the electricity um, market, because currently ESCOM has a monopoly and that's that's bad for ESCOM. You know, if you go and look at the uh, ESCOM is not there to make a profit because it gets bailouts, it gets government guarantees on its debt. And that's why it's in such a state, because um, you have, if you go and compare the, and I, I don't have the figures with me, I used it in a speech um, last year somewhere, but if you go and look at, firstly, the economic principle of a monopoly, you know, a monopoly should, in terms of um, economic principles, never make a loss. It's impossible for a monopoly to make a loss. That's economy 101. ESCOM does make a loss. Okay. Then, if you go and look at, compared to, let's say, 2003, the number of staff members that ESCOM had the, versus the energy that was produced, the electricity that was produced. 
um, it was it was quite different to what we now now have. We almost have 50% more, if I'm if I'm not mistaken, staff members employed by ESCOM, whilst we produce more than 40% less electricity. So more staff, less product. And to get to Afriforum, that is the type of initiatives we will need. Now we need to address the the red tape, the administrative problems that there is with private um, and independent power production. We also need to address the issue of the grid, because our problem in South Africa is not limited to power pr production or generation. Our problem is also with regards to the network. And the minister, Minister Gordon especially, um, denies this. But the experts and those that know that what's going on will tell you that the network is also failing. There's a lot of power substations and um, renewable energy plants such as the wind plants. If you drive uh, in the Eastern Cape there by uh, Imansdorp, that, that, that there and uh, on your way to Cape, to Cape Town from this side, you also see a lot of, of, of wind energy farms. The, 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 the experts say that very little of that energy goes into the grid because the grid can't handle more energy. So it doesn't help that we have initiatives of private energy production if we can't get it to the end consumer. So that also needs to be addressed. But we need more um, initiatives of private production whilst we try to solve the issue with the network so that when the network works, there, there needs to be um, production. You know, one of the other problems is, for instance, something very um, practical is uh, your cell phone companies, cell phone towers. Uh, the amount of money that a company such as Vodacom needs to spend on keeping their towers going during um, load shedding is something mind-blowing. Um, it's, it's eating up the profits of, of, of those companies because they, they need to, to, um, to keep those towers going. Now, the new regulations prior to the changes that took place last year, they were not allowed to even produce power for their own usage. And that's something that's now a little different with the, with the, um, with the new regulations that took effect last year. But we still need more. And actually, whilst we're in this crisis, there should be no limit. Why is there a limit being placed? on the amount of megawatts or whatever that a private um, company or private producer can generate. Those regulations should completely be scrapped. Let someone, if there's a big company such as Vodacom or AfriFirm in some type of form who wants to generate electricity and sell it to whatever their own usage or wherever, let them do that because we have a crisis. Now you also have talks of, um, of government and especially municipalities that want to tax and, uh, and uh, place some kind of penalty or tariff on consumers installing solar energy. So if I put solar energy on my house, I have to now pay um, the municipality or ESCOM because I'm using solar by, energy. By the way, this type of thinking must stop. Hotel, how is that legal? Because, I mean, you're getting the energy from the sun. How is that even legal? I mean, it's, it isn't like taxing water, like um, taking water from the sky. How is that even legal? No, exactly. So, ESCOM, and, and that started in 2008, you would remember. In 2008, ESCOM started saying, please use less e electricity. So, they, they, they encouraged their consumers, their clients, to use less electricity because they didn't have the capacity. From 2008 up until now, they haven't really done anything to actually solve the problem. Actually, it became worse because of contracts and tenders and state capture and appointments at ESCOM that, uh, uh, that was a complete, um, uh, 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 that conducive to criminal activity and uh, left us with the situation we are in. But that being as it may, um, they they want to tell you don't use electricity we need to to limit electricity usage but you're also not allowed to do your own thing to put up solar panels because then we have to 
we are we are losing um, a revenue. So it's it's a complete mess. The other thing what we are saying is people that do go off the grid that install solar geysers, solar systems, and what else, should be subsidized. And um, one of the uh, suggestions that we are making, plans we are putting on the table, is to make it zero VAT. So that you don't pay VAT on those type of products. 15%, you, you actually say 15% to, to a large extent. The other way is that you get subsidized on your income or your company tax. But there's a lot of administrative problems. So the easiest is to say make it zero VAT rated. But government wants to do the, the, the opposite, as, I, as I've said. But uh, we and a lot of civil organizations are pushing the agenda to say, if you go and look at other countries that have had an energy shortage, such as India, for instance, they started subsidizing people to get off the grid. Rather do that than, than um, penalize someone. For getting off the grid yeah absolutely but i mean we can have all the solutions as long as the anc is in control things are not going to change quickly but okay voter pivoting you you seem like you're the strategy guy of the phrase from plus um, were you surprised in 2019 with the election result was the phrase from plus generally surprised with the election result in 2019 we weren't surprised. Um, we, uh, throughout our, our research and also um, the results of by-elections um, from, well, let me start with 2016, actually. The municipal elections in 2016 already showed that there was a turn towards us, that our strategy is, is working, and that we are winning the confidence of, of the electorate. Um, so we already did very uh, much better in 2016. And since then, um, up until 2019 by-elections, we showed a lot of growth in support. And our research showed that we would do much better. Um, obviously, there was uh, some surprises, such as uh, getting a provincial, um, national, regional member of parliament from the Western Cape. We didn't predict that. Um, we didn't predict two uh, NCOP members, so that was a surprise. But that we would do better, we knew. We knew that uh, it was it's it's needed in South African politics to have a party that stayed fast in its policies, and that is what we've been. We've never changed our policy directives. The way that we communicate, we adapted, but uh, we 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 um, we stuck to what our founding principles are good values values people could associate with and being steadfast and i think that was the recipe of success and also uh, in 2021 during the municipal elections that growth um, was uh, was continued do you think peter Mulder joining um, jacob zuma's cabinet do you think that damaged the brand of the party it's a difficult question. Um, as I said, I was in his office. Um, I worked in the Department of Agriculture in his office as, as Deputy Minister. But yes, it, it was a very difficult decision to take. In 2009, we were confronted with the issue, and, and let, let me also say, the research, not only our internal research, um, but research from Ipsos and, and uh, a lot of other um, organizations showed that we would do very well in 2009 in those elections. Um, and then all of a sudden, the Jacob Zuma um, court case and uh, the, um, the prosecution that was being dropped um, happened. And it was a few, it was less than two months before the election, if I remember correctly. And I remember I was doing, I was still a junior member, obviously, and I was doing door to door canvassing. And uh, before lunch and after lunch, the, the, there was a complete change in how people spoke to me and how people accepted me and accepted the, the Freedom Front Plus. And we didn't do very well. We, we kept our, our positions to a large extent. I think we lost. Um, two members of provincial legislatures in that election, but we, um, we kept our representation in the National Assembly, but we didn't really grow as we so should have. 
Sorry, Walter, I, um, w some context, why is it important that um, Zuma um, won or lost this court case? Why was that important to the Freys from Plus? Yeah, let, let, let me say why. The DA did very well in being there, and Helen Ziller did it very well to change the election campaign overnight in a stop Zuma campaign. And a lot of people that considered us and was on their way to vote for us changed their vote again and said, let's borrow our vote to the Democratic Alliance in this election because they can stop Zuma. They are the only one that's big enough to win the ANC and stop Zuma from becoming president. Now, it didn't happen. Um, the DA didn't get near enough to, to win the ANC, but we lost a lot of support. If you read Ellen Ziller's um, autobiography as well, there's a part that she writes about in 2009, their polling showed that they're losing a lot of support towards the Freedom Front Plus, and they changed also the strategy to go to Africana voters, especially going back to the traditional electorate, leaving the ANC voter and focusing on the Freedom Front Plus voter. Um, she uh, went on a roadshow from Kronstadt to Bloemfontein, flipped uh, Pannekoeken at the Bloemfontein SCO and did all those type of things. But anyway, so we lost support. We knew that we are in a difficult position. We, we didn't get the number of votes we, we should have, and we were fighting for survival. And a decision was taken. We have this offer on the table. We also don't think Zuma is the, the best president for the country, but he's the president now. Do you sit on the, and, and we weren't near, remember in 2009, the ANC did very, very well and uh, much better than a lot of commentators and a lot of analysts expected. And the question was, how can we serve our electorate and play an active part? Do you sit, and if you use the analogy, analogy of a rugby match, do you sit on the stadium and you watch the match taking place and you shout at the ref, and you shout at the players not doing what, what they are supposed to do, or do you go into the scrum and do what's necessary? And the decision was taken, let's go into the scrum. We try from that position without being co-opted, try to play a part, especially for agricultural uh, community. Uh, the narrative at that stage was that agriculture can be in a lot of trouble because of the ANC's narrative with regards to land and so forth. So that was the decision take, but uh, most people out there and understandably so, saw it as us being co-opted, saw it as us only taking up a position for own gain, personal gain, and not actually serving our elected. I can say from being in the inside that we utilized that position to do a lot more than we would have been able to do just as an opposition party. And we changed a lot of policy directives at that stage within the Department of Agriculture, a lot of successes we had, but it's not very, it's not big, big things, but it changed a lot of people's lives and it, it, it assisted a lot of people. So me personally don't think it was a mistake, but I do understand that it did cost us a lot of votes. If you take 2011 into account, the municipal elections, we lost a lot of support. We then regained support again to 2014 in that general election, but we remained to a large extent at the same position. We, we won back a seat in the Northwest legislature that we lost in 2009. And then we completely consolidated and, and uh, went back to a path of, of growth in 2016, as I said. So yes, we lost support, but I don't think it was a position that we didn't utilize to the benefit of our electorate. Interesting. Um, voter, okay, back to the strategy of Freys from Plus. What do you see as the long-term future of the Freys from Plus? Do you see it morphing into something else? Because it sort of has the brand of the Afrikaner Partei. I mean, a lot of the leaders are former members of the Conservative Party, and some say it sort of has to morph, rebrand into something else, like for example, a classical liberal party or a Republican party like the Republicans have in the US. What do you see as the long-term future of the Freisman Plus? Well, I think that um, 
that that change has already occurred to a large extent or started to occur uh, since 2013 actually because 2013 we we rebranded the party we changed the mission of the party we reworded the mission of the party and uh, we moved away from 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 what what you said now um, yes we, we we haven't we weren't able especially before 2019 and 2018 to a large extent to actually um, get that narrative going and even though we were repositioned a lot of people still perceived us and even today perceive us as extremely Africana conservative right wing um, very set in a, in a very small target market we are a party of my four we stand for minority rights we stand for group rights um, we have uh, clear policy directives and I think that's also what happened in 2019. A lot of people from various communities voted for us and said, we, we don't agree with everything you stand for, but we do agree with this, uh, for instance, on affirmative action. We agree with your policy on education. We agree with your policy on, on uh, whatever. Um, and we, we became a party and are still becoming a party, still uh, moving in that direction of being a true alternative to people that don't only agree in a majority game of playing for numbers. Because what happens in South African politics is if you want to win the majority vote, you change your policy and you actually dilute your policy directives to be a very, very broad church. We are not a narrow or small church, but we are a party that has specific policy directives and we don't change that to just become a broad church that loses um, any, any, any actual um, leverage as a political party. I believe coalitions um, will be the future of South Africa. It's currently very unstable. A lot of the permutations that it took on um, after the 2021 local government election because of uh, how it played out um, and uh, a lot of them are, are unstable but I do believe that uh, as we mature as a democracy that will be the uh, long-term uh, solution to South Africa is coalition governments, um, hung parliament, hung councils where there's no outright winner and then the Freedom Front Plus is a party that can play and does play a very significant role to serve our electorate in those type of governments to say, we will go with you, we will vote for this budget, but then you have to implement one or two of this policy that our electorate voted for. And why that's important is if you vote for a party that doesn't actually have a clear policy, what do they demand within them? What do they negotiate on? in a coalition. They don't. They negotiate for positions. We don't. We don't want positions in, in government. We want to, uh, to, to actually serve our electorate and uh, forward the policies that they voted for, the mandate that they gave us. And that's why policy politics are important. You mentioned classical um, uh, Democrats and, and, and those type of uh, of uh, directions at the end of the day I, I think you know you can analyze a lot of parts you can analyze the freedom from plus and say we are more classical um, uh, democrats than the dar currently you can say we are conservative right wing whatever there's so many perspectives there's so many labels there's so many political science um, blah blah that that doesn't actually serve the electorate at the end of the day it's about what you stand for what you what you promise your electorate in terms of policies and being steadfast in those policies and values the values that make that that uh, that, that the freedom from plus stand for have never changed and those values are values that people do associate with and that i believe that is why people voted for us in 2019 and once again in 2021
But, uh, no, um, I, I get that point, but it seems to me this might be some outdated principles, just like communism by now is completely outdated. I mean, I think in, uh, in the phrase from plus principles is Afrikaner self-determination. Isn't that something that should be let go? I mean, it, it smacks of a return to apartheid. Shouldn't we rather talk about federalism or Cape independence and rather uh, push that to the side? What we reworded the mission, that, that was uh, the principle that we started off with in 1994. And there's a whole reason, obviously, the party started for, for a particular reason. But as we, um, as we changed and uh, grew, we, the, the, the policy is self-determination for all groups in South Africa. We believe that all groups do have the right to self-determination. Self-determination does not necessarily mean um, a territory and being completely uh, separatist. It, it also means that there should be the right to association of cultural um, uh, and heritage um, and language and language councils and, uh, you know, take, take for instance, self-determination principles in Canada. It does not mean that if you are, if you stay in Quebec, that you have some conclave or whatever for French speaking Canadians. But on your tax return, you mark that you want your tax money to go to a French school or to an English school. Um, that that's your choice. And you can be English speaking and you want to go, you have your, 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 your tax money or portion of it go to, to, uh, to uh, French schools or the other way around, it's your choice. So it's it's very different from apartheid. It's very different from all those type of, of narratives. It's it's about having the freedom to choose and be self-sustainable in what you choose as part of a group. If you say, I'm an individual, I don't want to associate with any cultural group or any language or any whatever, then it's your choice. That should be your freedom of choice. If you say, I am an Afrikaner, or I am a Koza, or I am a Zulu, or I am a Nam, or I am a Khoi, then you need to have the freedom to associate with structures, to have mother tongue education, and to further that. And although we have a constitution in South Africa that should promote and in, in, in um, codified, it says, you have this freedom of association, group rights, and so forth. But we know in practice that it does not happen. We actually are on the, on the uh, if you go and look internationally, we are on the very low end of actual, of that, those actual internationally recognized practices of freedom of association and actual self-determination. That's a modern concept around the world, and that's actually um, the, the modern um, de uh, uh, democratic principles that should be installed in South Africa. A lot of solutions in South Africa lies within that freedom and that self-determination and people having that freedom to actually say, I may be self-sufficient, self-reliant, I can associate where I will and where I want, I can assist where I want and I can build and also um, not be disrespected with regards to my own heritage and uh, my own culture, um, but live in a South Africa where there's, uh, mm. where there's a multitude of different uh, cultures and different heritages. You know, that makes sense. I, yeah, Perhaps someone should update the membership form because there's still written Afrikaner self-determination, the recent one that I saw, um, instead of the general self-determination that I think a lot of South Africans would support. Okay, but um, voter, um, what, what's going on with the CFO in Tswane? Uh, uh, what, what's the story there? Because the story I heard is that the DA basically kept an ANC cater, um, the, the CFO of Tswane, and did nothing against this person. What, what is the story there? Well, let me say we are currently, uh, we, the coalitions work in this sense that uh, we have uh, local structures, management committees, and uh, a, a coalition caucus, and then there's national structures, uh, the coalition technical task team that I serve on, and then also the coalition oversight group that I also serve on. We met last night um, 
and on Friday as well, past Friday, to discuss uh, the issues concerning uh, Tuani. We are very concerned with regards to the audit outcomes and uh, the mismanagement and irregularities that took place there. The CFO, it's, it seems, is, is not in employment. He's, he, he, he was um, he's out of employment of the city for, for a few months now already. But uh, the uh, resolution was that there will be criminal charges laid against him. We are still investigating, as a coalition oversight group, what led to this, because what is important is that uh, this took place now. Uh, we must also remember that this coalition started governing um, in November 2021. This financial year that the audit outcomes are uh, based on ended in uh, June 2022. So there's only a, a, a certain part or a part of um, that financial year that we are responsible for. Regardless of that, there needs to be consequences for the administration that allowed this to happen, but also for the political heads that were there or are there that uh, allowed this to happen. So we, the difference between an ANC run um, municipality where the audit outcomes have been adverse for, for two, three decades and nothing happens is that this coalition government feels very strongly about uh, clean government and when these type of things do happen, consequence management is very important and the Freedom Front Plus as part of that coalition is uh, very clear and frank about it that uh, consequences, no matter who it is, for political leadership and administration needs to, to, uh, mm. to occur. So that is that's currently uh, but, but I mean Walter didn't wasn't this person didn't he work for an ANC ran uh, municipality before this I mean why didn't the DA get rid of him when they took over I mean how could they have trusted this person We we are still gathering that those those facts um the problem with and that's when when you take over a government uh when you take over a municipality you can't just rid uh get rid of all the the staff members there's contracts there's labor laws there's all kinds of things in place and uh, it's it's not that easy most of the municipalities that we took over in 2021 it's not a situation where you can just uh, snap your fingers and you can appoint new staff members and that's one of the biggest dilemmas that that we that we sit with that people cadres were um, employed in a lot of cases those um, officials were not appointed on merit they're not the best uh, people for the jobs they were appointed due to the ANC affiliation and now you're stuck with them and you need to go through labor law and so forth to get rid of them um, and you can't just get rid of them because they were appointed by the ANC they have to transgress you have to prove the transgression and all of that disciplinary hearings all the contract needs to run out. A lot of these um, senior managers or senior officials are on five-year uh, term contracts, but unfortunately, those five years do not run with a political term. So there's always an overlap, and usually there's quite a significant overlap that uh, a whole term you can go, uh, almost a whole term you can go with the previous term's appointment, and that makes it extremely difficult. What is your general opinion of the Freights from Plus and Gauteng and the leadership of Yaku Mulder? Do you think they're doing a good job? We are doing um, very good in Gauteng, I believe. Um, I believe we are making in, inroads and Yaku and his team is working very hard to, uh, to really there where we are in government in uh, three metros at this stage and where we are in government in Mughali City, actually really trying to um, to do very well work very hard to also serve our electorate not only be in those positions but make a difference so Gauteng especially and the Western Cape as well have a different dynamic because we're in government we're not only an opposition party but we're in government and uh, they do very well with regards to that I think if you go and look at the growth that we've experienced since 2016 in Gauteng in especially in Tuane, then uh, 
that is uh, where the most of our, our voters come from and where we, sh we uh, showed uh, the most growth and uh, we are we are um, doing a lot to serve Gauteng because we also believe that if Gauteng falls um, out of the hands of the ANC, that is a, a big step closer to getting rid of the ANC completely. You mentioned it earlier, the only way to actually solve any of these problems, to solve the energy crisis, is to get rid of the ANC. And if we get rid of the ANC and we form a coalition government, a responsible government in Gauteng, the next step will be nationally, and that is what we are working towards. Um, Voter, my last question to you is, um, I see we're running out of time. Um, you, I think you, the Freisman Plus initiated um, high treason charges against Julius Malema. What, what is the story there and what's the update there? Well, we did, uh, we did it twofold. We uh, laid a complaint with the uh, Human's right, Human Rights Commission. They came back to us and they actually did find in our favor. They found against um, Julius Malema and said what he, what he said at that uh, provincial conference um, of uh, the Western Cape was hate speech. And uh, there's, there's still sanctions that, that needs to take place. We are saying to the Human Rights Commission that they should do the same as they do in other cases. You know, um, they took uh, Steve Hoffman to the Equality Court. Um, they should now do the same with Julius Malema. It doesn't help. They only find that it, it uh, constitutes hate speech, but they should now prosecute. They should go to the Equality Court and follow uh, the legal route. Um, we also laid a criminal complaint, secondly, um, against him for high treason, amongst other um, uh, uh, transgressions, uh, criminal transgressions. And uh, we are still awaiting feedback. Um, obviously, the uh, police and the prosecuting authority, yeah, does not always understand how to do and how to, to conduct uh, those type of cases, but we uh, We've uh, the latest feedback that we got from the uh, from the police is that they are still investigating it, and that uh, the docket will be moved to the national prosecuting authority for them to then consider if they will prosecute or not. And what do you think are the chances of this going anywhere? Probably not anywhere before two thousand twenty-four. No, you know it's 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 very difficult because a lot of these cases go to, go nowhere. And uh, a lot of the complaints, us as a political party, um, lay against municipal managers, against Malema, against a lot of other figures out there for transgressing um, legislation, uh, constitutional um, impediments, and so forth. We, um, it doesn't go anywhere necessarily. But we do believe that we should never stop. We should always put pressure and we should use whilst we do all the other things that we daily are busy with daily should never stop using legislation laying complaints and putting on pressure because what's good for one is good for the other um, the rule of law should apply to everybody and we can't just sit back and say it's not going to help anything it's going to go nowhere so we're not going to do it we will continue to do it um, when there's aid speech we will um, lay complaints, we will put pressure, and we will continue um, this fight for, uh, for equality, for equal rights, for equal opportunities, and for a better future for all South Africans. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, and no, I agree with you. I think some, some people just lose hope. But um, Voter, this has, been, this has been very interesting, very insightful. Um, is there anything you'd like to leave our viewers with before I conclude? Well, let me say, um, you know, you started um, asking about where I started, where I get in, got into politics and so forth. You know, a lot of times I won't say I do it daily, but I do it um, a few times a week. I look in the mirror and I ask, are you still in the right job? Or are you still here for the right reasons? Because politics, you don't choose politics. Politics chooses you. This is not, a, it's not an easy job to have especially when you're an uh, opposition party, whilst government does not listen to reason, they are busy with all these things that you can clearly see is not going to work, and you have to fight 
um, for a reasonable outcome and you have to fight against the brick wall in many instances. But I believe that the Freedom from Plus and our representatives, and especially if I sp speak on behalf of myself, we are there to serve the people out there. And when we not, when I'm not there anymore, when I can't get, uh, when I can't look myself in the eye in the mirror and say, I am making a difference, even though it's one lady's pension problem or one problem that, that I could solve for one person, then I would change career. But whilst I can make that one difference, sometimes it's very small, but it does change somebody's life. I will stay in this job and I will try my best to, uh, to change the future of this country once again to the benefit of all South Africans. Awesome. Well, thank you, Voter. Very inspiring. And yeah, thank you so much for your time. Um, I hope to, we, we get um, an opportunity to meet in person soon. Absolutely. Thanks, Donald. Have a nice day. Yes, you too. Bye-bye.